All right, everybody, let's go ahead and quiet down a little bit. Hello. All of your conversations are awesome, um, but we do need to get rolling here. Excuse us, technical difficulty. As promised, Andrew Morris. Cool. Thanks. Um, OK. Um, my name's Andrew Morris, and this talk is called Using Gray Noise to Quantify Response Time to Cloud Provider Abuse Teams, a very verbose title to get the day started. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. The format that I like to give talks like this is if you have any questions or feedback, like please feel free, or if I say anything that you feel is incorrect, like please feel free to raise your hand or just shout something out um, kind of in real time. It's easier that way. Uh, so first of all, I just wanted to say thanks to the founders of the conference and to the staff and to you guys for coming to watch me talk this morning. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so thank you. A uh, little bit about myself. My name is Andrew Morris. I'm the founder of a company called Gray Noise and like the CEO, I guess. Um, uh, before before uh, starting Gray Noise, I worked on the Endgame R&D team for a little while. And before that, I worked for some security consulting companies. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter, or that's my email if you want to reach out and chat at all. This is kind of what I'm going to go over, the format of the talk today. Um, I'm going to just like briefly like skim over what Gray Noise is, um, talk a little bit about like the background of the problem, pitch some research questions, uh, qualify everything really heavily so nobody sues me, um, and then like talk a little bit about the like the methodologies that I use to go through here to do some of this research, and then why some of them are really bad and the results uh, of all of them, and then some recommendations. So, real quick, kind of before I go too terribly much further, has anyone in the room heard of gray noise before? Sweet, that's so many more people than I thought. Um, so for the people who haven't. Uh, gray noise is a big system that collects internet background noise and analyzes it and provides context on it for various different users and various different use cases. So we move a lot of data around because there's a lot of people scanning and attacking devices broadly on the internet. Um, there are a number of different primary use cases for gray noise and for the sake of this conversation, we're really going to focus on this one, identifying compromised devices, because one of the byproducts of listening to all the internet background noise is that you end up finding where a ton of compromised devices are kind of all around the internet, right? So if, you're, if you have internet right now, and if you want to kind of dig through the data like while I'm talking about this, you can go to viz, viz.graynoise.io, which is the gray noise visualizer, and it basically just has a bunch of data in it that you can kind of click through a little bit. Um, here's some examples. Here's some of the examples of the tags that like we provide for some of the bad guys. We like gray noise labels good guys and bad guys. So good guys being like these are, you know, search engines like mass scan organizations stuff like that. Like these are some of the tags that we have on the on the good side. No, you're cool. It's just vendor warnings. You know? Oh, oh yeah yeah yeah. Um, <laughs> this is it's 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 free, so um, yeah. <laughs> you, this this is free. If anyone can query any of this stuff, yeah. Um, I promise I'm not going to vendor pitch at all. Um, and then this is and then this is this is all of the like the bad stuff that we tag. So this is kind of like just an example to help get your get your head around it. So this is the kind of stuff I'm going to be talking about today. So there's lots of compromised devices all around the internet like lots of them, right? And a lot of them, or a subset of them, are compromised because they're vulnerable to some kind of remote exploit or they have easily guessable or default credentials. And so basically what'll happen is some, you know, commodity botnet will basically like log into the device using the default credentials like Mirai or something like that, or like PHP my admin and it'll deploy some kind of some kind of malware or some kind of backdoor or something like that. And then once the device gets infected, like once the server or the you know IoT device or whatever gets infected, it starts like spreading to other devices as well, sometimes, right? And 
this kind of activity, a good, good examples of this would be like the Mirai botnet, the Satori botnet, the Mustek botnet, etc. Um, so when a device becomes compromised inside of a cloud provider, uh, basically it's going to start attacking other hosts just like it would pretty much anywhere else. And so the whole premise of this talk is the, the cloud provider, at some point the cloud provider abuse team is going to be made aware that a like in AWS or something that one of their devices or devices that is in the AWS customer network, for example, starts attacking everybody else kind of on the internet. They're going to start getting abuse complaint reports or something like that, and they're going to do something about it, presumably, right? And so there's going to be some period of time in between that device or those devices becoming infected inside these cloud hosting providers and them no longer being infected, right? And so the whole premise of this talk today is I want to talk about how much time generally passes. I, want, I have a number of different questions that I want to answer that I've been just kind of wondering for a long time, which is the first one is how much time generally passes between a device inside of a cloud provider starting to attack other hosts on the internet and no, and no longer attacking other hosts on the internet in aggregate per cloud provider, right? How much variance is there between the different cloud hosting providers? Uh, how much variance is there internally to one given cloud hosting provider? So it's the you know the median or the yeah I guess in between um, the like any one given cloud hosting provider to kind of find like the deviation that you should be working off of. Um, I didn't really get to that one, so we're gonna have to kind of skip number three. Um, and then number four, how many compromised devices are there total in each cloud hosting provider? And five, what is like the longest running, you know, how, how long is the longest running compromised device based on what we see in gray noise about all of these different cloud hosting providers, right? Again, this data is all free. You don't have to, like, the only way that you'd have to pay for it is if you'd want to incorporate it into your product. You can go home and do all of this stuff yourself um, on our APIs. So I want to walk away with an understanding of how the different cloud providers handle compromised devices on their network and how to reproduce this kind of research with on your own side and understand gray noise a little bit and kind of understand some of the use cases for it. Hence, I want to talk about using gray noise to quantify response time of cloud provider abuse teams. Blah, 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 blah. This is going to start my like super, super heavy kind of qualifiers page. So the first thing is like, this is not intended to shame any uh, cloud hosting providers. This isn't like a talk where I'm really comparing who's better, who's worse, or I'm not talking about effectiveness. All I'm talking about is just measuring something and I'm talking about response times. There, this is such a massively complicated problem that in no way am I trying to basically say who's better than who. Um, I'm just taking a number of different steps to look at, to basically frame the data that we're observing specifically. And I even talk about why a lot of the different methodologies that I use in here completely breaks down and why it sh is kind of largely unreliable and how biased it can be. So I'm going to talk about that. Uh, the second thing is like work sucks. Like nobody wants to come in and like it sucks even more when somebody else is coming in like telling you how to do your job. So I don't want to do that. Um, working in trust or abuse or fraud or anything like that is like really thankless. Um, you know, it's a lot of work and you're always overworked and all these teams are always overworked. And so again, the last thing that you need is for somebody like, you know, cartwheeling in and telling you, you know, like all of the things you're doing wrong. So that's not what I'm trying to do at all. Um, and like another qualifier here is that like there's a lot of policy stuff that can affect some of the findings that I have here. For example, you know, one cloud provider may have a you know 24 hour grace period between when they know about like, hey, this thing is compromised, uh, versus another one may have like a 48 hour grace period or something like that. And according to some of these statistics that I'm going to use, that might make them it would extend the length of the response time, but that's a policy thing. It has nothing to do with, you know, what they do or do not know about. Some more qualifiers. Um, there are a ton of collection biases in all of these, and in, in all of the methodologies that I'm using. This is by no means conclusive. This is just basically, like, a way to look. A way? It is, it is on. Um, Oh, no worries. All good. Um, so yeah, and so then another thing is like every different cloud provider and every different network and on the internet has completely different priorities. For example, an internet service provider versus a giant publicly traded company versus like a tiny, you know, kind of mom and pop data center, like they all have different funding, they all have different priorities. Like this is gonna vary wildly. Um, 
one distinction is really important to be made. Whenever I talk about like Google or Amazon, I'm not talking about their corporate network. I'm talking about the, the customer network, like the, the shared hosting network, right? I'm not talking about compromised devices inside of like Google's corporate network, right? And then the last thing is like, and this is no way a reflection of the company's security posture. This is just a set of observations based on some data that I see. Please don't sue me. Um, the data sources that I use, really it's just two, are the primary data sources. I use Gray Noise and I use IP Info to do uh, the major uh, virtually all of the IP enrichment and basically to get all of the information about like the size of some of the IP ranges, to get the ASN information, basically to get a bunch of IP metadata. I use ipinfo.io, which is like one of my favorite services in the universe. It's dirt cheap and I really can't recommend it enough. Um, so these are the subjects that we're gonna be talking about today. We have Amazon AWS, Google Cloud, DigitalOcean, Microsoft Azure, Oracle Cloud, Rackspace, Linode, Softlayer, Vulture, Tencent, Alibaba, OVH, Single Hop, and CenturyLink. Um, I picked those because they're basically the largest ones for pretty much no other reason. Um, these are like the biggest kind of the biggest cloud hosting providers that I pulled out of a hat and. Uh, in no particular order, like we're just gonna kind of like cycle through the results for each of these. So here is where I'm gonna start talking about the different methodologies that I use to try to quantify some of this data and basically um, the data that I collected and, and why some of them are really, really bad and why some of them are less bad. Um, so the first one is incredibly bad. Um, it is like pure quantity. So the question is, uh, given a cloud hosting provider, like we'll just say AWS, how many unique compromised IPs are there inside of that cloud provider, right? So you can already kind of think immediately the main place where this is gonna break down. The main place that this is gonna break down is some, oh, <laughs> that's right, there's seven. Uh, no, there's, uh, so like, it, you know, the main, the, main place, the main place that this is gonna break down is it depends on the size of the cloud hosting provider. I mean, for example, I could start a cloud hosting provider right now in my garage that has one IP, <laughs> and as long as I make sure it's not owned, I'm 100% good, right? So that doesn't make any sense. So a big part of this is, is size, and this is not adjusted for size at all. This is a really stupid way to gauge anything. Um, so you should beware anytime. I mean, and this could be applied generically across like third-party risk assessment kind of broadly. Like if you have a, a network that you're trying to gauge something about and you and you know about some signal or some compromised devices inside of it, if the network is gigantic and you see 100 compromised hosts, that's not that big of a deal. But if the network is teeny tiny and you see like, you know, five, then that's maybe a really big deal, right? So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, so that's where I have all these. If you want to recreate this on your side, you can run GNQL, the organization's name, classification malicious, and then just check the count. Uh, this was the kind of breakdown that I had for just doing this, and again, this metric sucks, so like, don't take much away from this, but this, I did want to show just the raw results. So basically, we've got, from left to right, Amazon, DigitalOcean, Vulture, Google, hopefully you can read this, if you can't, then I'll send the slides out. Um, but basically, we've got a lot, the number, oh man, you can't see the, that's, wait, those are thousands. And that's, that's 5,000, that's 1,000, that's zero. Sorry, man, rookie move. Um, that means that they're all gonna look like that, that's horrible. Um, okay, well, what are you gonna do? Um, so basically, yeah, this is, this is just straight up like how many compromised devices we know about in these cloud providers over a four month sample. So again, that's 5,000 going down. Um, and this is a 120 day sample. So from basically this week minus 120 days over the last four months, right? So for scale, this is what just some random ISP, like big ISPs look like. This is a big Chinese ISP and a big Vietnamese ISP. So just to kind of give a little bit of context, like this is the kind of scale that we're talking about with some of these networks. Cloud providers actually do a really good job, all things considered, right? Um, that's, that number on the top is 100,000, I think. Yeah, that's 100,000. So, just food for thought. Uh, here's the raw data. So, I did, and I was kind of thinking ahead that those graphs might not work. Um, so, I did have just the, the raw numbers out here um, that you could kind of take a look at. So, again, 
this metric sucks. Don't use it. Um, it's it's not very telling. It's in it can be uh, used inappropriately, in my opinion. Um, so then the second metric. This is like a ham-fisted cumulative time metric. So with this methodology, basically what I've done is what is the total amount of time in hours between the first time Gray Noise saw something that was bad and the most recent time Gray Noise saw something that was bad. This also sucks for the same, a lot of the same reasons, which is it doesn't account for size at all. Um, and so basically it also doesn't take IP recycling or anything else into consideration when you start talking about cloud hosting providers. So this is like a little bit better, but really not really. Like the only thing that this does is this accounts for like temporally as things move forward, um, where the, the only thing that this metric does differently than the previous metric is that one device that is compromised for a super long time, which is worse, um, will carry a larger weight than you know, one device that was compromised for five seconds and then no longer, right? So that's the only thing that this really captures. So with this, again, this metric is still pretty bad, but um, you know, whatever. So we actually are not cut off here. That's 2,500 hours, total hours between, uh, total time between first seen and last seen hours of everything. So it's 2,500 hours cumulatively of uh, the first and the last time that we saw a device that was compromised. Yeah, what's up? I have two minutes left. Holy. How can you contribute? Uh, so how you can contribute is like, honestly, from like, spread the word and feature requests. And if you have budget for it, like give us a call. Cause we, we only sell to people who have like money that like have budget for this to support what we do, right? I mean, that does, I know that sounds dumb, but it's like everybody else gets it for free. So that's the main way. And then how to weaponize this. Like if you are at a SOC or if you work in a cloud hosting provider, we will tell you where all of the compromised devices are inside of your network. Just send us an email. Um, especially like if you're an ISP or uh, if you work in a, um, yeah, in a cloud hosting provider. Real, real quick, basically, uh, man, I thought I had 40 minutes. That sucks. Um, so then basically what we ended up with is the third methodology is cumulative infected time adjusted. So how many state of infected hours per 10,000 potential IPs are there for a given cloud hosting provider? Um, basically, this is what it looks like. What, before we adjust for time, this is what it looks like. Or before it's adjusted for size, this is what it looks like after it's adjusted for size. And then uh, what's the average time to close of an infected host? So the average period of time between when the host gets infected and when it is no longer infected uh, total. And this is like... Take 10? Oh my god, okay. <laughs> All right, that's cool. I am sweating right now. <laughs> oh my god, okay. Um, so, <laughs> alright, just briefly, <laughs> methodology number three. Um, basically, so this is like adding up all of, like, Every host is in a constant, with the way Gray Noise works, every host is in a constant state of either unknown, benignness, or infectedness. And we track it temporally, so when it starts being infected and when it's no longer if, uh, infected. And then there's, there's explanations for all of this. I don't need to get into it. Turns out that basically doing like, accounting for like time interval overlap is like actually a way harder problem than I ever realized. Like basically just taking a number of like, different time intervals that potentially overlap with one another and adding them up to just find the cumulative time from start to finish of a given thing, it sucks. And so I ended up spending a lot of time on Stack Overflow for that. Um, and then basically, so the reason why this method, this methodology is good because it accounts for the size. For example, um, you know, AWS has like a gajillion IP addresses that they own. Um, and, you know, Linode has far fewer. Um, and so this basically, it accounts for that. Um, but the only problem is it it, bre it breaks down because it basically means the larger that, the more IP space that an IP, an, a cloud provider has, like the more padding they have to screw up, which is kind of true, but it's also kind of not true because not all of those, IP, it's, it's nuanced. I'm not really going to try to even get into it right now. Um, this is kind of what it looks like throughout time. Like this is what it looks like on the back end. This literally 
address. Here's an IP. This is why it's bad. And then this is like, so we have all these over potentially overlapping timestamps that I had to add up and get the cumulative time for everywhere. So this is it before it's adjusted. So this is just total compromised hours, raw compromised hours, right? And then this is it after we adjust for the size of the, uh, the for the size of the network. That's 50,000 total compromised hours per 10,000 IPs over on the left. That's what this is, right? And then I have the math right here for everything. Um, yo, so Amazon has like this many times 10,000 IPs, which is a shitload. Um, and so then, what's the average time to close of an infected host? This is the average take given a, a given cloud provider. What is the amount of time, on average, that it takes from the device to start being infected and start attacking everybody else on the internet to no longer being infected when presumably either the infection is remediated, the host is quarantined, the host is decommissioned. We have no idea, but from our perspective, it's just not attacking anybody anymore, right? What is this amount of time on average, the time to live or the time to close, right? So this is the ti average time to close in hours cumulatively. That number is 200. Um, and so this just basically means from start to finish, averaged out the amount of time, the amount of hours that it takes for a host to no longer be, um, no longer be attacking other people. This is the raw data behind this because again, I was afraid my graphs weren't going to work. And then here's just a fun little bonus metric: how many devices are compromised in all of these cloud providers, literally right now, like this very second, that are attacking people as I am speaking in front of you this very second. So this is that number is a thousand. So basically, we have. You know, we've got 200, 800, Tencent's got like 950. Now, I want to caveat this metric by saying this is fine, right? These cloud providers need, like tomorrow, most of these are going to be remediated, right? That's what this whole talk is about, is that these, these devices get owned, and then all the abuse teams have some time to do something about it. So this is another bad metric, but I kind of wanted to put it in for honorable mention, so you can kind of see like how much work these people are doing to like remediate all these. Like, I can check all these exact same IP addresses tomorrow and see how many of these are still basically owned. But to be honest, the answer that I'm going to get is going to be some version of the average time. Like, I'm, it's going to be the same. It's, I, I'm probably going to get however many on average less than based on this calculation, blah, 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 blah. Right? Um, so basically, that I mean, that's it. Like my recommendations, if you were a cloud hosting provider, if you work for one, or if you're an architect for one, or if you're an abuse team for one, or whatever, is to just be proactive. Like use. There's a lot of open. Like Gray Noise does this, but a lot of like open source um, threat intelligence feeds will provide this data. If you know your ranges, which you know you do, um, like you can you can search you can search these to get all the IPs back that you know are probably owned. You know, definitely scrutinize abuse complaint reports unless they're coming from a noisy abuse complaint report person, like some people will send out, universities are notoriously bad for this, they'll send out abuse complaint reports if they get like scanned like on two boxes with one port. They're like, you're trying to hack me, and it's like, nah, you're really not, right? Um, and so like ignore those, but like build out a list of like believable abuse complaint reports. Start probably with strict firewall controls and do like a whitelist approach like the way AWS does it, how when you start off, you have port 22 open, but there's nothing else that's open, and you kind of move on. Um, consider vulnerability scanning your own environment. Like, I know that this has a lot of implications, and I understand that it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Google does it. Vulture does it. They have a lot of success with it. Um, and then, like, you can ask us about, we, I'll tell you about where all your boxes are that are owned. And that's it. Uh, quest questions, yes. The question is, are we sucking in data from other people's MISPs or other things that are automated? The answer is no, uh, just because uh, none of our data is crowdsourced right now. It's all internal for OPSEC purposes. Uh, so we collect it all ourselves. Down the line, we're going to need to start doing that. Other people suck our data into their MISPs, but we aren't pulling anybody else's data in right now. It's all kind of like firsthand. Any other questions? Yeah. Do the question is do certain threat groups target certain providers? And the answer is yes. I mean, we there's like there are it's really interesting because there are a lot of there's I call it macro targeting, which is where basically instead of groups attacking hosts on the internet completely opportunistically, they'll attack specific segments of the internet because for example, if they're looking for an IoT device, they're not going to look in cloud hosting providers, and if they have like a Joomla exploit, they're not going to look in residential networks. So they have they use a lot of these same data sources that I'm talking about like 
IP info and like MaxMind and some of those, and they'll pull back all of the networks like that belong to AWS or Azure or something like that, and they'll blacklist those and punch that into ZMap and then start doing whatever their thing is everywhere else. And it's specifically to avoid people who do like what Gray Noise does. So the answer is yes, and it sucks. Yes. Question, yeah. Sure. Yeah. We don't pull in data. For, the question is, do we pull in data from DShield? We don't pull in data from DShield. DShield has a lot of remarkably similar data on certain pieces of what Gray Noise does. But we like Gray Noise tries to cover more, and <clears throat> they. I don't. It's DShield is a little bit of a black box. It's really interesting. Like the data is awesome, but it's it's unclear to me from the outside. Like how uh, DShield gets a lot of its data, where it comes from, like what s some of the. It, it can be a little unclear, so I try to like. I always recommend that people use DShield um, and all the other ones. Uh, from my perspective, I'm trying to be. Um, I don't want to use other people's stuff too heavily, especially because at the end of the day, like we do try to make money from certain companies, and I don't want to you know make money with their product or anything like that. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. How many of these groups are scanning IPv6? One time, um, one time, like six months ago. So Gray Noise has IPv6 exclusively nodes. Um, one time, like six months ago, I saw packets come in from the same IPv6 IP to multiple Gray Noise nodes that only had a IPv6, and I lost my mind because I thought, like, this is it. IPv6 is here. It's the year of the Linux desktop. Like that's what it, it's all here. Um, it turned out that it was actually the cloud provider, which already knew where all of the IPs were, and it was like doing like a, it was like an NTP. I don't remember what it was, but it wasn't. I've never to this day seen uh, IPv6 uh, hit multiple distinct IPv6 only nodes from the same source. Um, I'm still looking for it though. And there's like hacks that you can use to do it, but like just specifically based on the data that I've seen, I've never seen it to answer your question. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, what's up? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the question is how much scan traffic comes from researchers versus malicious people. I actually do, in fact, have an answer for that because of like all of those labels that I was telling you about where we label like good guys and stuff like that. So approximately 1% comes from, between 0.1% and 1.5% um, daily comes from benign researchers. Uh, about 75% comes from malicious IPs. And that's a hard question and it just to answer and it just happens to be that I use that coverage as a, as a metric internally for gray noise to figure out basically how to answer that question when I'm talking to users. So I have basically dashboards set up on my side to basically say this is how much benign stuff there is, this is how much unknown stuff there is, and this is how much malicious. Basically, um, it's overwhelmingly malicious. And there's only at this point about 20 to 30%, which is still unclear, where they haven't done anything bad, like they haven't exploited anything or tried to break any laws or log in anything that doesn't belong to them, or they're not indicative, they're not e exhibiting traffic that is only indicative of a compromised device. But we don't know what they're doing. We don't know who they are, so they're like, looking on a port, sending a thing, and we're like, I don't know what this is. I, you know, I have no idea what this is. And that, the unknown makes up about 20 to 30%. Um, it's overwhelmingly malicious. I remember thinking like, man, so many people are complaining about Shodan, like Shodan's gotta be blowing up the internet. And I like actually built this whole thing out over like years of my life. I'm like, finally, I'll find out why. And I look at it, it's like Shodan's like a fraction of a percent. And I'm like, what's everyone so pissed off of Shodan about? Like, this is ridiculous. Yeah, does that answer your question? Okay, and I can give you empirics on all that. Like I can give you the data to support every single thing that I just said, so hit me up if you want that. Any other questions? Nope. All right, that's it. Uh, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>